Hello everybody, I am Jeff in Control Robinson, and I hope this day finds you doing quite swell. We're going to talk about Protoss versus Zerg, and specifically we're going to look at harassing the Zerg players. How do we affect their economy? How do we get them to make mistakes? And how do we win those games through harassment? Let's go into that game now. So we've got a PVZ on Shakira's Plateau. Our opponent is going to be VVV Glon, a fantastic young Zerg player. Made a great run at MLG Columbus in 2012. And uh, he's a good opponent. So today we face him on the ladder. This is not any kind of superficial match. This is where we get a lot of our practice done. But I want to talk about harassment in PVZ. What are the different stages? What are we looking for? What's an acceptable trade? These are the kinds of questions that I want to have answered, and if you're not asking said questions when you're playing a PvZ, I want you to start doing that. That's definitely got to be something on the Protoss mind. If you've ever faced a Zerg that you've left kind of unkempt, you know, you've just kind of left him to his own devices, he probably has done some pretty heinous things like build 75 straight drones and then make a 200-point army and come after you. Those are the kinds of things that make us wake up in cold sweats and uh, scream in the night like a, like a hysterical, terrified little child. Now this is the first stage. This is something I'm quite famous for. A lot of people look down on it and just kind of talk about how uh, he just cannon rushes every game. Well, that's fine and good. You know, you can... I'm actually paid to try to win games, and that's exactly what I'm going to try to do. And this is one of the ways I do it. So let's talk about this at the different stages. First and foremost, we're going to nine pylon scout. This is Shakira's Plateau. So if we start in this location, the lower right-hand side, there is only this base or this base possible. Fortunately for me, I did scout him first, but this is the natural place you'd scout. You don't want to scout cross-map um, because you're going to actually potentially circumvent both the towers, or if you do hit the towers, then you're actually making your way off course. You know, the, straightest, uh, the best way to go from point A to point B is a straight line. Well, if we go ahead and move off that line, that's just going to take us longer to get from point A to point B. So... I scouted here first because you're able to hit up that tower and see weird things like, a, I don't know, like six drones heading towards you or something weird like that. I don't know. It's just better to be safe than sorry. Um, so as it is, I get to his base. I scout to make sure I'm not being like six pooled. I then drop the pylon at his hatchery spot. And first and foremost, if there was ever a question for you guys, is it worth it to block the hatchery? Let me answer for you, that for you right now. It absolutely is. Even if they throw down that, that spawning pool, um, or if they're saving up for the hatchery, of course, that's like a dream scenario. Uh, even with the spawning pool down, it's still worth the investment. The reason is, before the spawning pool finishes, if a Zerg had it their way, they would throw down that hatchery and delay things like their lings. They'd probably only make two to four lings because they don't need the six to kill a pylon or to go after you in this situation. Um, having the queen slightly later is, of course, uh, a little bit of a cost to them. They'd like to have that queen out as soon as possible, but if it's, if it's an exchange for getting the hatchery down faster, they will go with the hatchery down faster. Now, why did I put my cannon here? Can't a queen just reach it from this spot right here and go ahead and kill that? Absolutely. The reason why this cannon has been morphed in here is you'll notice the drones are having a tough time getting a surface area of attack on it. It's because it's behind these minerals and it's up against this wall. So there's really, at maximum, I think five drones can attack it as long as this space is blocked off, which it is with the cannon or pylon, excuse me, and then usually I put my probe back here to go ahead and harry this drone so that if he tries to uh, kill this cannon, he's either going to lose the drone or probably retreat with the drone, in which case two drones do not bring down a cannon fast enough. So this is all pretty specific, but this is really important math for you guys to kind of understand just because getting this cannon up represents our ability to say, hey, you're not going to get this hatchery here anytime soon. In fact, even Zerglings that run past are going to take damage but more importantly, oftentimes it throws the Zerg off their game. Not a lot of players are doing this strategy. And in fact, if you've watched my other videos at EvilGenius.net, there's a good chance in the PVZs you've heard me talk about this. Um, you don't have to invest this much in it. In fact, this, this uh, pylon's a little bit probably too much because um, there's only three drones out here. And as long as I'm attacking said drones, this pylon, this can, excuse me, should get up just fine. So I actually could have saved 25 minerals. But let's say he brings more drones over here and actually really goes to town on, um, on this cannon. And like, as you can see, it's actually, it just kills two drones and one Zergling, and then it's done, right? Not that big of a deal. Was that worth 150 minerals? Well, 
point of fact, it kills two drones and a Zergling, so it's exactly not worth 150 minerals, but what it does represent is the sixlings instead of like the four. It represents that his drone saturation is lower. It represents the fact that his drones came off the mineral line to attack a pylon that otherwise he wouldn't. You don't drop a pylon and then four drones come over there to try to kill it, right? That's not what they do. They wait till Zerglings come out. So in the end, was that cannon worth its cost? Absolutely. And again, I want to actually expound upon that with the analysis I gave earlier as well, which is that it doesn't have to kill the Zerg. It can just throw them off their game. How many times does Zerg player face this? Not very often, I will tell you that. Um, I don't play a, a million ladder games. If I did play one million ladder games, then all the Zergs would have plenty of practice <laughs> against it because I do it all the time. So from that stage forward, let's go ahead and take a look at the game. He's behind in Harvesters. His hatchery is, uh, you know, about 75% done. My Nexus is about 75% done. Almost exactly, actually. That was pretty cool. Um... Good timing on that one. Pat on the back, Jeff. So, as it is, the Zerg's kind of falling back on a normal game plan here. It's going to have three hatcheries, gasless. He's going to make, you know, 40 or 35 supply of drones before he ever gets some gas. It's kind of very standard stuff. So, we are now entering phase two of our harassment. You'll notice, zealots are coming off this gateway. Now, this is actually fine for any build you're doing, okay? I like to get fast plus one. Um, I like to take fairly fast third and fourth gas the natural so I can start doing things um, like sentry play and warp prism play but that's all um, you know I've talked about that in other videos or if I have it do check them out so you can see them um, because they're definitely there but you know whatever style you're playing stargate robo gateway timing whatever this is the next stage of harassment that I want you to consider do you have to go up to three results no in fact I normally don't go up to three results I go up to at least just two and what I like to do with them is dislodge Zerglings off these towers and put the Zerg in a state of alert. Because when a Zerg is in a, an alert phase, what they end up doing is they spend money they otherwise wouldn't on things like additional Zerglings, like Spine Crawlers, like Spore Crawlers, and they start to get nervous. As we can see here, the probe is quick to follow behind these Zealots. Um, in fact, I think the Zerg actually doesn't see the probe, except for with that tower right there. Um, so that was a little bit sloppy by me, but it's actually kind of cool to show the probe, too, to be honest. Like, right now, he's not sure if he's facing something like an uh, eight-gate push. You know, what is this probe actually trying to do? And what, in fact, it is trying to do... Let's take a look here. Oh, he, do he does see the, the pylon, okay. Is it's just trying to enter that next phase of harass. It's going to drop a couple pylons here. One would not do it because it could die. Behind these minerals is really cool because from here, again, it's that surface area of attack again. Uh, the Zerglings actually can't really effectively destroy it. But you can see me dropping pylons in different locations, but very aggressively. Now, he has vision of both of them, or actually all three. And that's okay, because this is our next phase of press. What do I have behind this? Well, I just have four gateways. But you'll notice I'm teching up as well. And if you watch that production tab, you should see a pretty constant stream of probes, unfortunately, as I say this. There we go, there's two. Um, but all I'm doing right now is trading potentially plus one zealots, for Zerglings. Yep, these are plus one Zealots. So as, unless he has Roaches, which he does start to have pop out here, these Zealots are going to do a tremendous amount of damage. Now he's trying to both kill the Pylons and go after the Zealots, and all I need to do with these Zealots is probably better micro here. So I was chasing that Queen a little bit too long, now I'm going to go after some drones. Any drones killed here is great because he's actually spending all his larva on Harvesters, or excuse me, attack units. Here he's actually working in some drones. Sklon is a very good player. But oftentimes you can get a Zerg to just spend money on units, um, attack units rather, while their harvesters are actually slowly getting whittled down. And I'm trading Zealots. And Zealots are just minerals, which means I'm actually banking a lot of gas here, despite going Dark Templar as well as con constantly building out Immortals. And I should have some sentries back here. Okay, I do have a couple sentries just to be safe. But otherwise, there's that Warp Prism kind of going to town and spotting for this pylon. It actually functions as a pylon now. But again, I'm just killing drones wherever I can. I'm disrupting mineral lines. I'm affecting his economy. These roaches are more than a match for these elves. Okay, it doesn't work. But look at this. Now, would I ever tell you that you have to cannon rush every single game and that's exactly how you're going to get yourself an advantage? No, absolutely not. This is 100% an opportunity. And this opportunity was created by virtue of my harassment. How many times do you watch a Protoss Reserve where the probe just walks up this ramp, doop doo doo, somehow ninjas past the spine crawler, gets gets past the queen, and then starts building cans above the third? You just don't see it. It just doesn't happen. The only reason this is happening 
is because my probe was spotting for this pylon. But before it died, I moved the probe off because what's the point in doubling up on the cost right here, right? If, if they find the pylon and the probe's next to it, ta-da, you found not only the leprechaun but the end of the rainbow as well. Why would I allow him to have that scenario for himself? I want to hide one or both, right? So I hide the pylon here. Okay, if he finds the pylon, great. My probe's up here free to, again, spot for the pylon on the low ground or recreate that scenario. But in this case, me being the guy that I am, and I, I, I definitely love cannons, everybody knows that, I go ahead and drop those up here. Now, is this going to end the game? Do those two cannons or whatever end this game? No. In fact, later I make a mistake. I don't actually capitalize on this nearly as much as I'm supposed to. But again, this is kind of a cool scenario where somebody else executing at a higher level or learning from my mistakes, as it were, can make a better decision. And they could, they could actually potentially win from this position. So let's keep our eye on this. I warp in a couple of sentries because I want to block the ramp. I go up to three cannons. Um, these cannons reach the mineral line. They shut it down. They make that full base pretty ineffective because you can't actually just tell your drones to mine these, these minerals uh, unless you only have like six drones doing that. And in fact, it even reaches the hatch. So that's a very dangerous situation for the Zerg player that's going to only get worse. Meanwhile, I've got the warp prism kind of opening up. There come some DTs here. He recognizes it instantly and instantly makes an overseer. So again, Glon playing at a very high level, but just kind of look what's happening. And I want to draw attention to something real quick here too. What is this production tab been doing all game long? I've been chrono boosting out Immortals. So I actually only have just the one right now. I'm about to have a second and soon I'll have probably a third. I've added a couple gateways. I've been building probes. Um, I could be doing a better job of chrono boosting. You'll notice that, of course, while you're harassing, it's always a question of how active are you with your micro, but also maintaining your macro. Um, so I want to do a little bit better of a job. But also, you'll notice, eventually, I'm not doing the harassment phase anymore, right? The zealots, at this point, have done their job. I'll be warping in DTs. But outside of that, I'm just going to be warping in probably sentries back home. So my army is going to fall back on that natural army. It's going to be immortals. It's going to be sentries. And then, depending on what we find out about the Zerg, we'll sprinkle in things like stalkers or zealots, if it's like Ling and Fester, and eventually go to Colossus. So that's what's kind of happening back here. Now over here, this is that kind of mistake I was talking about. I've got more than enough for a couple of force fields. Soon I'll have enough for even another pair. And what I'd like to do is force field this ramp so you can't just run up there and kill the cans. But you'll notice I don't see it until it's a little bit too late. It starts killing those sentries. And then I'm like, eh, one force field that's misplaced. Very tragic. Could have been cooler. Oh well. DTs eventually get cleaned up inside his base. You'll notice he's got that regular Zerg uh, supply lead, of course. So things aren't like gigantically in my favor. This is not a game where I point out to you guys that this is, you know, where he just gets ran completely over and never stands a chance. But I'm talking about the different phases of the harassment and the scenarios slash advantages that they do create. So now I have DT map control. So you're gonna go around to the towers, clear those towers. Cannons get cleaned up. That was not, that was not worth it for me. Not at all, I would never make that argument. Um, so that's too bad, but one cool thing. Remember all that, that blabbering I did about, you know, um, eggs in a basket and all that jazz over here, talking about moving the probe away so that if he does find the pylon, we don't lose the probe too. Well, I didn't want to build like 20 cannons here. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. And instead I said, you know what, even if this gets compromised, I'm going to move that probe back. So I built the pylon there and I have the probe over here. Never with the pylon. I don't want him to find the pylon and the probe together. Leprechauns and rainbows, that's what it was, not eggs and baskets. As we can see, he's looking for that freaking probe. Probe's been a thorn in his side, doesn't find it. Sweet. But this pylon's a uh, good harass. I've got DTs out, but later in the game, I can warp in rounds of zealots. Even if he has a spine crawler and a spore crawler, what he doesn't have is enough defenses to hold off a warp in of units. And as it is, I'm going to go ahead and aggro his army now. So there's those immortals, even a fourth joining up. Just immortals and sentries, not an impressive army. That is not an attack army. If I were to move out here, where my force fields cannot hold off all of his army, I would die. But what I can do is sit in the middle of the map, warp in those stalkers, which have decent upgrades as well, and I'm going to start taking my third. With this tower, I'll see that if he wants to try to you know, go around, if he wants to circle around and go towards the natural, then of course that's a scenario where I'm going to go ahead and have to move my army over here and intercept him, use my force fields to get that advantage I need, etc., etc. Meanwhile, everything's normal for him, right? Well, what's this? We have a guillotine taking shape over here. A lot of zealots are being warped in. Zealots, not great in this situation, right? 
these roaches would absolutely run over said zealots. They just simply would. It just wouldn't do a lot of good. But what do I have going on? It's the warp prism. Always, always have a warp prism in your PVCs, and that's one thing we're having put on display right now. Now let's take a look. Here comes his army. It crosses into the middle of the map. I now see it. I know exactly what's going on. My DT is even going to die here, the martyr that it is, but it shows me that he's at the middle of the towers. My army's not biting me just yet. But here comes a warp in one here. Here comes an attack here. Let's take, a, let's take a really closer look at this because this is utter chaos going on right now. This is a double prong harassment. I've got a couple of stalkers that are going to shut down this mineral line. If he doesn't pay attention, he's going to lose every one of those drones. In fact, he's already lost three. These zealots would not do too much good in this mineral line because of the spine crawlers. They would just take damage and they would eventually die. But what they are good at is focusing down critical structures if left ignored, obviously. Three zealots have pretty damn good DPS, especially at two attack upgrade. Um, if there's a spire here, which is very common, if the infestation pit is put back here, which is very common, those things will get targeted down. As it is, the spawning pool is the nearest, most important structure. So I'm going to go after it. Meanwhile, these zealots are going to go down here. They killed the spine crawler, and now they're going to focus down the hatchery. The zerg is put in an incredibly hard position. Now, I want to point something out to you, and there's a lot of you that are going to write this off, perhaps rightfully so, um, depending on the date for which you watch this video. But as it is, a lot of zergs do this right here. Notice this. One hot key of an army, okay? Now, obviously, optimally, you want to have two, three, four hotkeys of an army. That's not why I'm pointing this out. The reason I'm pointing this out is because a lot of your opponents have a very tough time with the multitask aspect of this game. So right now, all of his, arm, his units are on one hotkey, which means he's going to have to tell them to go to one place, then he's going to have to click on another group and tell them to go to another place. The bottom line is more actions than what are necessary for him to do those things which means that we now control the pace of the game. So as we can see here, uh, I don't think I even get that spawning pool, but I'm focusing down these drones. I should have focused down this hatchery a little bit earlier. I wasn't able to. I did kill the spine crawler though, which is a critical note here. And I have a pylon ring around this freaking hatchery. It never stands a chance. And I've actually killed 12 drones now. 12 drones. If we look at the harvester's loss, 31 drones have died to just the one scouting probe for myself. This hatchery is weak, but not dead. My army is starting to get massive because still, ladies and gentlemen, I have been building immortals. If you're gonna be on roaches, I will be on immortals. That is just fine. This warp prism, of course, got away scot-free. Meanwhile, here comes another warp in. This time it's an assassination squad. Those guys are expensive, but man, do they pack a wallop. And the Zerg's just in the middle of the map like he's supposed to be. Zerg wants middle map control, but unfortunately for him, it's going to come at a cost. There goes that hatchery. They're going to run away just to go ahead and probably snipe this. Warp Prism can rejoin the harassment. Here comes that entire glob of Zerg units. And meanwhile, my army is still taking shape. A second robo, probably a robotic space somewhere, or at least I forgot it, but we'll build it soon. And he loses that hatchery as well, and with it, the GG. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, well, pfft, Zerg's max, there's no reason for him to leave. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, look at his money. He has no bank. He has a huge gas surplus that he can't actually spend. He's upgrading hydros that he can't afford to, to, to build at all. He's got a spawning pool that's about to die, so he's going to have to remake that. I mean, the, the, the list goes on. Meanwhile, supply-wise, yeah, he's only 44 supply ahead, which is not that big of a deal. Harvester-wise, he's actually trailing. 65's okay, especially when you consider the fact that he's actually only on two mining bases. He's actually fully saturated and then some. Um, but army-wise, he's stuck. He, he made just pure roaches, right? That's because of the multitask of the game. That's because of the harassment. He was never able to really sit down and think through his army by scouting me, which is something he did do this game. He's kind of got his eye on what's going on around here. But he's not able to use that information because I'm the guy controlling the pace of the game and with this third base up and at it for me it's really uh i mean he left and it is considered a, you know like a, an early gg there's, there's more fight in him to be had but the chances of those roaches killing six three attack immortals uh i mean if you're a gambling person i would i would hope you would side with me on this one and uh that's that so let's go ahead and just recap real quick what kind of harassment we talked about there is going to be that cannon rush. Now, you don't have to make it a cannon rush. It could be a pylon hatchery block followed by 
a cannon cancellation. As long as you get at least four drones off that mineral line, the 37 minerals you lose when you cancel that cannon will be worth it for you. From there, we control the pace of the game with things like having that probe drop proxy pylons. Even if they're inside vision of the Zerg player, it alerts them that, hey, you now have to spend larvae on Zerglings and roaches, whereas I'm only warping in four zealots at a time, but I'm developing my economy by building more probes, Corona boosting upgrades, getting immortals out, and sneaking in sentries back at home so that eventually um, I can take my third without skipping a beat. And the harassment, if it does a lot of damage, you win. If it does some damage, you're even. If it does no damage at all, you're not completely out of the game, but you need to make some choices here in the future. And that's exactly what I did. I wasn't getting a lot of damage with my zealots, but what I was doing was buying myself time so that my Dark Templar tech could end up doing the damage that I needed to get that advantage in the middle of the game and start to sneak in little things like Warp Prism Harass and Cannon Rushes at bases at like the 15 minute mark, which is not normal at all. So hopefully you guys kind of have an idea of what it takes to make a scenario so that we as Protoss players can take advantage of our, uh, the weaknesses of our Zerg opponents, but also so that we can control the pace of the game and be the decision makers within that PVZ so that we can say to the Zerg players, hey, here's how you're going to be spinning your larva, and if you don't do a good job doing that, you're probably going to die. And that's a pretty powerful message to send out to Zerg players. So hopefully this was really beneficial for you guys. I had a lot of fun doing it. Check out my other videos at evilgeniuses.net. If you're a Terran or Zerg player, or frankly, if you're interested in other Protoss replays, peruse around evilgeniuses.net. We've got a lot of great players making some great content for you guys, and hopefully some of it will grab your attention. Thanks again.